Good morning, everybody. Um, that was, I found that a really remarkable session. Um, I, as was introduced, I'm a, the VP and Chief Scientific Officer for Infectious Diseases. I'm also a practicing clinician working about a day a week at the VA in, in Durham, North Carolina. And so the patient stories that we just heard are, uh, are jarring in some respects, just to hear about the, the challenges that some individuals have to go through to get the care that clearly they needed. Uh, but the flip side of that is the, what's happening on the provider side. Uh, and that's what this panel is going to be focused on. Before we get into the details of, of uh, the, the specific panel members, there is a video that we'd like to show. Uh, this is a video uh, taken of Dr. Lael Yonker, who was in one, one of the introductory videos. Uh, she's going to be talking about some of her experiences during the height of the COVID pandemic. Uh, Dr. Yonker is a pediatric pulmonologist at Mass General who used her day-to-day -day patient challenge experiences to inspire innovation that ultimately made a difference in the lives of those patients. Uh, and you know, very often in the translational science space, we think about uh, bench to bedside, and, and this is really a bedside to bench and back to bedside story. Uh, so a, a lot of really interesting things to see. So if we can show the video, and uh, in the meantime, I'll ask our panel members to come on stage as well. I'm Lael Yonker. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist, and I take care of children with lung issues. Missy is a rare syndrome that affects, you know, about 9,000 patients, 9,000 children across the U.S. Long COVID affects millions. We're learning that probably long COVID is a more indolent uh, presentation of Miss C. Miss C is the most severe post-acute sequelae of COVID. But we don't have any clinically available tests for either of these diseases yet. But if we can start to show some, some hints and we can actually get to a diagnostic, and then you can start to think more, more progressively about therapeutics, but you really need to have those diagnostics in place. And so we set up this biorepository to be able to collect samples from children um, who are infected or exposed to COVID to try to understand how their bodies were responding differently. We found that through a blood test that there was a marker where the tight junctions, um, there was something called zonulin that was being released into the blood, and the zonulin causes the tight junctions between the gut lining to loosen very slightly so that viral particles can leak into the blood. So then we added this zonulin inhibitor as an adjuvant, as a sort of add-on treatment, and we found that the patients improved and they stayed better. And so having uh, precision diagnostics is really important because it gives patients answers. And really, if you have sort of something that ties all of these symptoms together in a, a very objective way, then that really allows the advancement for all sorts of research around that disease process. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so this session, as I mentioned, is going to be focused on the provider perspective. Uh, there's a lot of information that's coming in, uh, a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges, and, and the panel that we have today is going to discuss some of those. So please, uh, uh, thank, or please welcome to the stage uh, Mara Aspinall, who is the, uh, one of the partners at Illumina Ventures, uh, also on the Danaher Scientific Advisory Board and also a member of ABCAM's Board of Directors and a co-founder of the Biomedical Diagnostics Program at Arizona State University. Uh, next to her is uh, Dr. Kemi Badaki Makun, uh, who is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and the Director of Research for Pediatric Emergency Medicine at, at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, Lincoln Nadold, who's uh, Chair of the uh, President and CEO of Culmination Bio, uh, and Dr. Scott Friedman, uh, the Dean for Therapeutic Discovery and Chief of the Division of Liver Diseases at Mount Sinai. So thank you all for being here. Uh, and what I'd like to do is, is really queuing off of that, that video from Dr. Yonker, um, she touched on some critical points regarding the amount of new and complex information that we're, there, we're being inundated with. We, we heard earlier about the opportunities for diagnostics and really uh, novel diagnostics and precision medicine. Uh, but all of that, as we also heard, can result in 29 hours a day of just reviewing some of that information. And so how do we find that balance? Um, and, and how do we keep from getting overwhelmed by all of that data, which can certainly result in inefficiencies of care, but still how do we monopolize and take advantage of all of that? Um, so with that as sort of our focus, I'd like to, to start off by posing a first question to, uh, to Kemi, which is how do we unpack that, I guess, in the perspective in the, in the day of a life. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your experience 
what you see day to day in terms of your patient care experience, but specifically from the perspective of the information that's coming in. How much information, what type of information are you dealing with, and how is the amount of information out there impacting how you care for your patients? Yeah, thank you so much for that question and for having us here. Um, I'd, I think from my point of view, I work in the you know, fast-paced, high-intensity environment of the pediatric emergency department. And thanks to the electronic health record, we have a vast amount of data on every single patient coming in, or on most patients coming in, especially if they've had any interaction with the health system before, even from somewhere across the country. The problem is, how do I look through all those you know, pages and pages and pages of clinical notes. How do I look through all those different individual data points, heart rates, um, you know, blood pressures, vital signs? How do I look at all the labs that this person has had and also take care of them and evaluate them within like 15, 20 minutes and, and identify what the critical illness is that I'm dealing with here? Um, and so, you know, there are many different things that people have done to try to address this uh, I think the 29 hours, I probably need those 29 hours to see every single patient that I see in the ED, and it's just not enough. There's too much information. Um, some people are doing really interesting work uh, leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning. So you'll hear from um, Dr. Jeremiah Hinson later, who is the head of our Center for Data Science, also in, um, in pediatric and emergency medicine at Hopkins. And working with his team, we, for instance, had... Um, done some work using only a small portion of that data, looking at vital signs and chief complaints and past medical history, so what's available as a patient just arrives in the ED, and leveraging AI and machine learning to identify patients just with those data points who might require uh, inpatient care or might need uh, critical care interventions. And so I think there's so much promise to actually leveraging all this data and using all the tools we have available right now, which obviously we'll talk about a little bit later. I'd like to add also that for us in pediatrics, we have the other spectrum, and in the emergency room, we have the other side of the data problem where we don't have enough data. So I might have a one-year-old that comes in, for instance, and can't tell me that they have a severe headache, can't tell their parent the same thing. How do I know what exactly is going on with this child? Or the EMS uh, team calls in, an ambulance calls in, and they say, I have an unresponsive 10-year-old, and they're coming in, I have a heart rate of this, a blood pressure of this, we'll see you in two minutes. And so I'm working with no data or very limited data at that point. And this is where I, diagnostics really come in, bedside diagnostics, right? So is that patient unresponsive because they're severely hypoglycemic? I can do a blood test and I can check at the bedside. Oh, yes, their sugar, the glucose level is only 20 or 30. So, I mean, that's a simple one, but there's so many other things. I mean, is this patient in septic shock? Could I have a diagnostic at the bedside? That would be very helpful within a few minutes and can help me target their care so that they can actually recover. Um, and then a third thing, uh, we also have the issue, as Maima mentioned earlier, of young people and children appearing very healthy until their disease process has progressed too far. Um, for me, I work with Dr. Yonker on the MISC study that she's talked about, but I had a patient that came in and looked at the beginning of COVID, a 15-year-old. She had a vague fever, looked okay. Um, we were considering sending her home because, well, she was eating well, she didn't have any pain. She told us she had a little bit of belly pain, but she's feeling better now after some ibuprofen. Uh, we almost sent her home, but we said, okay, let's keep you, let's admit you, and just see how things go. Five days later, she died from MISC. So for me, this whole issue, these are really pertinent, really urgent issues that we're dealing with here. And I'd really like to see how we can come together and you know, find these solutions. It's, it's uh, really interesting that the, your area of focus in the emergency department is, is by definition acute care. And, and a lot of what we've heard so far relates to oncology, um, where obviously the stakes are extraordinarily high, but there's also the benefit of time that a decision or a diagnosis doesn't need to be made within minutes ideally days, potentially weeks. But so what, what do you see in your area of practice are, are some of the diagnostic gaps uh, to help manage and diagnose and take care of patients who are presenting with an acute illness? 
There are so many, <laughs> but I can definitely try and point out a few. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, rapid bedside diagnostics are really very important for us. Not just as you know was mentioned earlier in the keynote address, just in terms of having good follow-up with patients, having their answers right away, but for us it's also a time issue in the emergency department or even in the inpatient setting. And even for patients, as was mentioned uh, earlier, I think Loriana mentioned it too, you wait hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks for answers, whereas if we can just get answers so much more quickly, we can do more earlier. Uh, so that's one thing. For us in pediatrics, we have the issue of not being able to get samples. So meaning for an adult, I might pull off five cc's, 10 cc's of blood, 20 cc's of blood. I actually have a calculated maximum that I can take per weight for every single child. And that's only if I can actually get it for the smallest children, I may only get a drop of blood. So diagnostics that can work with small volumes are also super important for us. Or as Dr. Yonker had mentioned in part of the earlier video, being able to actually have non-invasive ways to measure um, these um, blood values. And then I think third and most important for me as a pediatrician is let's keep the children on the forefront. We have a mantra in pediatrics, children are not just young adults, uh, small adults. And so they are totally different physiologically, developmentally. If we don't keep them at the forefront in terms of research and development, we won't know what's actually how best to serve them. And so for me, it's super important that we actually serve them well by testing and designing products specifically for them. Thank you. Um, Scott, I want to direct the next question to you, which is that uh, with, with the uh, volume of diagnostics that have become available, it can, it can be almost a double-edged sword in terms of diagnostic innovation. Um, as that information becomes more available, it does provide greater insights into disease, into their management, but also contributes to an information overload. And so how are physicians grappling with the increased complexity and interpretation challenge of distilling all of this data into something that's ultimately useful and actionable? Well, I think the metaphor of a double-edged sword is apt in uh, another way, which is the electronic medical record. So it's probably one of the greatest and one of the worst inventions in clinical care over the last, I don't know, decades. Uh, because on the one hand, you heard that you can capture information without having to go down to the record room like many of us older folks had to do. Uh, and so it's all there. On the other hand, it imposes enormous stresses on the physician. Doctors are generally given 15 minutes for a follow-up patient, 30 minutes for a new patient. I'm sure you've all sat there in the office and your doctor is looking at the computer and typing. So it's, it's uh, polluted the doctor-patient interface for one thing. Uh, for another, it's uh, providing a lot of information that has to be distilled in a very rapid manner in order to make clinical decisions, stay on time, continue the volume. And then beyond that, uh, the EMR has democratized access to information for patients, which is terrific, except that generates a whole round of inquiries uh, through uh, patient portals, access to information before the doctors had a chance to explain it to the patient, uh, and it creates a whole new level of work that hadn't been anticipated before. So I think from the practical perspective, doctors are really under enormous stress, and we shouldn't uh, uh, lose sight of that, uh, because they're asked to do more, absorb more, integrate more with less time, and uh, more pressure to be productive in terms of RVUs. So that's the reality. Now. Uh, at Mount Sinai, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, our dean, Dennis Charney, has had a vision for many years to both capture genetic and genomic information, uh, but also to integrate it with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, but that's going to create another level of data that the doctor has to interpret. So whatever data comes down, I think we really need to rely increasingly on the electronic medical record to distill and provide actionable information. Because in the middle of a 15-minute follow-up visit, the doctor cannot in any way integrate all of this diagnostic information by his or herself. And so we really are going to rely on informatics to help distill the critical information in making p uh, actionable decisions at the point of care. It's, it's really interesting to, to, to hear that, particularly following the last session we had where individuals were coming in with complaints that were, you know, were getting dismissed. Or, and, you know, it, it, and it's easy. You know, it's, you know, I, I reviewed many charts of transfers, patients transferring into your hospital, and, and you inevitably look at what all of the other physicians did, and, and you wonder, my God, like, why did they make that decision? Thank God you're here, and you're finally under our care, where we can do things right and better. 
And of course, you're probably the sucker on the other end, you know, with some other patient. And, and so the, the, what I'm trying to get to is that, that the providers, to your point, are struggling to get through everything that needs to be done in the span of 10, 15 minutes. They may be doing their best, but yet we're clearly failing our patients in many cases um, who are coming in. We're, we're all trying to work towards the same goal. So how, how do you envision, maybe Lincoln, if you have some ideas, how do you envision maybe navigating this, this, this shared vision of trying to improve patient health care, but the conflict in terms of the, how we manage the time and the data so that we can do what's required of us as providers while still actually meeting the patients where they need to be met. I'll let Lincoln follow up, but I, the only uh, way I can envision it is to integrate all the information offline and not insert it in the middle of the patient-doctor interaction because the more data they have to review while the patient's sitting there, the less time they have to actually hear about the patient's concerns, uh, make the right choice, and in the end, uh, being a physician is really about being a human being and uh, understanding that individual's needs, level of understanding, uh, and to ultimately assimilate that into a decision that's really patient-specific. And every time we impose more data and more, dis more information to review, we undermine that critical relationship that can't be replaced. You know, I, I feel like a major challenge we're facing is uh, the pace of innovation, the pace of uh, science has, has outstripped the ability of the frontline physician to keep up. And you know, one possible solution is just increasingly more support for that f uh, physician-patient interaction. I think gone are the days where we can rely on a single uh, a physician to keep the, the fund of knowledge, that black box of knowledge in their mind and use it during their interaction with the patient. They need support. And you know, we can do things like institutionalize uh, these processes. So I, you know, in addition to running Culmination Bio, I'm a medical oncologist. And so I see cancer patients, and, and I run into this on a regular basis. And when I started the precision medicine program at Intermountain Health in Salt Lake City, uh, you know, getting physicians to order next generation sequencing was almost impossible. Changing physician behavior, I think, might be the hardest thing in all of medicine. And the way that we really changed that is we began to institutionalize it. We put into the uh, the care pathways that they had to fill out when they see a new patient, a question about, did you order next-gen sequencing on this patient, yes or no? And it, they just had to answer yes or no. And that really transformed the amount of testing that happened. And we did a second thing. We implemented a, a molecular tumor board review of all of those next-gen sequencing tests so that the physician got some support on what does this very complex test really mean for me and the patient I'm about to see. And the result is that it really began to change lives. I mean, the best example of that was this 20-year-old patient that I saw um, uh, a couple of years ago, and when he was first diagnosed with a terrible, uh, aggressive, and metastatic uh, rare sarcoma, he was seen at, across the street at, at a medical oncology uh, uh, clinic and was told, you know, there's not much that we can do. You, you don't have a lot of time left, and it's true. He was deteriorating rapidly. And the recommendation was, you ought to go on hospice. And you know, this is a young man who was the starting defender on his college soccer team. And his college soccer team came and said their goodbyes to him. And on a whim, he came to our institution for a second opinion. And because we had institutionalized comprehensive, comprehensive genomic testing, he had a genomic test. And it turns out he harbored an ALK rearrangement in his sarcoma. We gave him an ALK inhibitor. Uh, a, a few weeks later, he was feeling better. A few months later, he had a complete response. And about nine months after he started on that medication, he was starting again on his college soccer team. And his teammates were thrilled. Two years later, he now comes and shadows me in clinic, and he's applying to medical school. He wants to be an oncologist. He still has no evidence of disease. So it's the, uh, the kind of, it's having support for physicians, it's institutionalizing these kinds of practices, and it's, I think, demonstrating some leadership to say, hey, here are the steps that we're gonna to take to make sure that patients have equitable access to this kind of innovative care and that physicians don't get left behind because we're insisting that they have to keep track of all of it all by themselves. Right, and I think that extends to genomic data that will ultimately be distilled into patient care decisions that are uh, assisted by either AI or some other software that allows the physician to make the right decision without having to go through the whole process of integrating it on their own. 
Absolutely, and we see that um, in a rudimentary way in the emergency room already, because again, we're in that really short um, critical time period, and we get you know decision support that's been designed to especially help us with diagnosis and therapeutics in the ED. So I can just see that expanding exponentially. Mar, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll broaden it a little bit because we've talked about AI and talked about the use of data. And clearly, one of the most exciting pieces of AI is generative AI. So we can start with ChatGPT. So a couple of things about ChatGPT. Um, the fastest uptake of any new technology, 100 million users in two months. So if you look at any other technology, nothing comes close to that. So that sounds very exciting. But I will say we are only just referencing the beginning of this. First, I expect that there will be at least two, if not three others within the next year of generative AI. And as powerful as it is today, it's all about text and data. I think the real step forward is when it can read charts and when it can read images and truly go forward to be what I call Diagnostics 5.0, which is a full integration. So if I take that and I look at the name of this conference, Insights to Impact, and Lincoln said it, the, the last I I would use there is institutionalization, and in the most positive way. So all of these um, insights that everyone talked about is really exciting, and the patient stories are great. The challenge is, as our last panel said, they're often N of ones. And that N of one happens when you have a patient who advocates for themselves or a physician who advocates. And what we need to do is institutionalize it. So I, I spoke a little bit about this at the speaker's dinner in terms of what are the ways that we can use data and truly institutionalize it so it becomes the rule, not the exception. And I'll say I think there are three ways to do it. One is put it as part of clinical practice, as we've talked about. And that is not going to happen by Danaher or any one company alone. It is going to be collaboration, and it is going to hap have to happen with Epic and Cerner and Allscripts to put it into the system. The challenge is many, many academic hospitals either have Epic or created their own system. So getting this into the system is not sort of an easy thing to do. It has to be, unfortunately, hospital, typically hospital by hospital, but it will start with the academic medical centers. Secondly, medical schools. We need to teach the tools of how to use these tools in medical schools. As everyone said, we can't memorize things. We went from kilobytes to gigabytes, and there's no way, no matter how smart anybody is, that they can do it. But only 30% of medical schools teach genomics, teach diagnostics. Um, it is scary to know how many medical school graduates leave without understanding sensitivity versus specificity and PPV versus NPV. They do not understand this because it's not typically taught. And in clinical practice, you only get some of that. Lastly, for the vast majority of physicians, we need to have continuing medical education that focuses on diagnostics. Diagnostics is an independent discipline, and in 47 states where they have CMA, to be part of it. So all of that sounds very long-term and theoretical, but uh, in the short term, we need to, I, I believe, look at it disease by disease, um, which is what's happened to cancer. We heard 84% um, percent of drugs now with approvals have companion diagnostics with that. Let's use cancer as the bellwether, because that is everyone's number one fear. And for good or bad, um, payers mostly pay for cancer. Mostly pay for cancer diagnostics and mostly pay for cancer therapeutics. So let's use that and go forward. But lastly, as I say that, I think it's important to recognize that even AI is not a monolith. In diagnostics, there's very different degrees. How do we use it for sample processing and pre-analytic? How do we use it for analytic? And where do we go for post-analytic, for report writing? Um, very interesting work being done by one of the payers that looks at pancreatic cancer patients and what tests they needed three, five, seven, and nine years earlier. 
that's a really interesting way to use the data that's accumulated um, in patient records, in claims data. So when we talk about AI, as exciting as it is, it's just like diagnostics. Diagnostics is not a monolith. It's screening and prognosis and treatment selection and monitoring. AI is not monolithic. So as we go back to our offices after this, it's fine at a conference, make sure that we're talking about the specific areas and how AI can work area by area, as opposed to sort of saying it can revolutionize medicine. It might be, but it's gonna happen point by point by point. Thank you, Mara. Well, we're gonna to touch on, on AI and ChatGPT and those sorts of things in a moment as well. I wanna go back to something that you had uh, talked about, Lincoln, the, the, this patient that you described who was in one location, didn't get the testing he needed, came to your center, got the testing he needed. It was a life or death decision um, that ultimately worked out very favorably. But as, as clinicians, with the, the, all of the different tests that we have available to us, it's very tempting to just stick to the things that you learned in medical school, stick to the things that you already know, the tried and true, um, and, and that adoption curve. I think you'd said that you know, one of the most difficult things to do in medicine is change the behavior of, of a physician. And so what are your thoughts or what are, what are some of the things that you're seeing that might allow clinicians to step out of that comfort zone of ordering the same tests looking to the same solutions or, or, or options and, and start to embrace some of these new technologies to get to a state of precision medicine? Well, I, you know, you heard Mara reference it and Kemi has talked about it as well. I think um, there are two things. First of all, uh, education is, is critical. And, you know, I, I would say providers, physicians in specific, are good at um, uh, education. They've done it for years and, and really devoted their lives to it, but we have to require it, and this is where leadership comes in, we have to require that as part of their continuing education. We also ha we can advocate for it through advocacy groups, um, and then, you know, na these national guidelines makers can stay up as well, and, and if we help educate physicians on how the guidelines are changing, I think all of that plays into it. Secondly, I would say, and this is paradoxical, because I have been a precision medicine advocate for, for a long time and practiced it myself, but we need big data, more data. And, you know, the thing that I've learned after a decade of practicing precision medicine is that you're best informed on precision medicine when you have more data. And so that doesn't sound like a great way to help physicians implement precision medicine, give them more data, but really what we can do is what you heard referenced, which is build these clinical decision support tools that uh, review big data in a generative AI fashion and provide support to frontline physicians that say, you know, you're about to walk in and see this patient, here's an insight from this patient's records that you may not have understood, or do you remember that this patient has an ALK rearrangement and you ought to be, you know, have you considered this medication for them? And so it's that kind of support tool uh, that is really software and AI driven that I, I think is going to help physicians continue to advance and progress and move forward instead of, you know, clinging to the tried and true test that they were trained on. And I think it, it if that happens, it will improve the doctor-patient relationship because it'll give them more time to look at the patient eye to eye. But it has to answer what I call the so what test. All of that big data is scary unless it comes down to what do I do now. And th that is so key. You know, it, nobody, physicians can't, nobody can walk into a room and talk to an individual and try to keep in their mind a hundred things or assimilate, you know, a, a thousand different analytes. And so it, it, there's got to be a summary so what statement in these kinds of uh, decision supports. Uh, I quite agree with the need to educate, but we're at risk of uh, sort of module overload. Uh, every time there's an unmet need in terms of education, our leadership has no choice but to put it into a required module, and it gets to be a little exhausting. So at the very least, if you're going to uh, uh, introduce new educational modules around precision medicine, which we should, try to make it fun. Yeah. Try, <laughs> try to make it less onerous and less like a, another checkbox that we need to, uh, to complete in order to continue to practice. Gamify it so it exactly. becomes a video game. And so, Scott, just to follow up on that, thinking about your, your career in the context of liver diseases, there's obviously been quite a number of advances, whether it's imaging or biomarkers, therapeutics. What, maybe looking back on that experience, what are some of the areas where, um, well, I guess let me change the question. How do you differentiate between a new diagnostic, a new tool 
that is worth integrating into your practice and one that you just sort of, yeah, interesting, and then sort of leave it by the wayside? Well, obviously, we look to the peer-reviewed literature, um, but it has to also be replicated. Uh, the other element, of course, is cost. So uh, I think maybe not at the initial iteration, but eventually we need to show that all of this additional input leads to faster diagnosis and better outcomes that cost less to the patient and the provider and the healthcare providers. So uh, in the case of uh, liver disease, you know, I, I like to remember that when I started in the 80s, uh, there was no treatments for liver disease, none. Uh, then we discovered treatments for hepatitis B, then we discovered hepatitis C, then transplant came along. Uh, in each case, that imposed a new set of diagnostics, new training skills, and new training programs to integrate that information. Uh, and I, I think in all cases, it came from uh, key opinion leaders actually speaking about it, uh, disseminating it, uh, creating a cadre of experts in that area that ultimately had credibility with practicing physicians. Great. Um, what I'd like to do is, is sort of run through the panel, and, and um, this is now getting back to the, the AI, chat GPT related question. Uh, Mara gave us a great sort of context in terms of how to think about it. What, what would you identify, uh, perhaps either in your area or more generally, uh, what are the things that AI is doing well today what are the things that you envision AI will do well sometime in the near future, within the next several years? And then what are the things that AI should never do? Well, uh, AI should never uh, try to impose uh, constraints on the doctor-patient relationship, uh, meaning, as I said, you know, that sacred interaction uh, should not be uh, uh, should not be affected or influenced by AI. Uh, how you talk to the patient, how much information you give them, how optimistic you are, you are and how you convey that. Um, currently, we really don't use AI in clinical practice, to be very honest, and we take care of very sick patients. So uh, I think, I, you know, the, the opportunities were really well enumerated by the other panelists, but I think giving a decision, using a decision support a tool to both integrate information, summarize uh, complex uh, histories, and make recommendations with some a opportunity to understand the basis for it. So you could click on a, you could say, uh, the, based on the available data, this diagnosis seems most likely, and then have uh, additional information on a hot link that will educate the provider at the same time as they're making a decision. You know, I think diagnostic test results are like the perfect application for AI. Yeah, as a medical oncologist, I'm seeing patients, and just recently I had a patient, uh, and the nurse called me and said, hey, I'm about to infuse this. Did you notice that his glucose is 300? And I thought, how, how did I miss that? And looking back, his glucose had slowly been rising. It was 150 and 200, then 250. And I didn't look at the entire spectrum of his, of his glucose measurements for the last several months. But an AI tool could have helped me identify that and say, hey, you know, let, let, uh, let's use AI to surface novel associations that you might otherwise miss in the course of your regular practice. And, uh, you know, Scott is right on. AI should never interfere in the um, patient-physician uh, relationship, but can help to surface these novel associations that we might miss and help physicians assimilate hundreds or thousands of data points and, and raise questions about, have you considered this or that? Yes, I'd have to agree with that completely. I mean, I think we have um, early AI models that have been deployed in our electronic health record system, EPIC specifically, from our Center for Data Science, again, led by Dr. Hinson, uh, where for, during COVID, for instance, there was an um, AI-based machine learning model that was implemented that helped identify patients at risk of severe illness and categorize them into three or four boxes and just said, uh, did you know this patient is at high risk of severe complications? And it was just uh, a helpful tool for the physician. So that's where I see AI uh, as being really very instrumental, uh, really digesting those huge volumes of data and summarizing it in, a, in an accessible way to the bedside clinician and saying, here, here's something, something else you might find useful for this patient, right? But AI, in my mind, can never be left alone to run loose and make all these decisions by itself. It needs to be supervised. So 
I agree with what everybody says, and I'll, I'll take it a little bit further. I think first, um, what AI needs to be is a really, really smart partner and doesn't take over, as everyone said. An interesting study in Denmark of breast cancer patients um, throughout their history of disease found that at each diagnostic step, if you had two AI systems diagnose them, two pathologists or radiologists diagnose them depending on the test, or one and one, a computer and a patient, a computer and, a, and an expert. Um, the computer and an expert together were 20 points better than either two people or two computers. So I think about it as your imaginary friend um, next to you. Um, and, but uh, as everyone said, not replacing it. Secondly, it doesn't come up a lot and may be controversial amongst physicians, but I think it could be very useful for physician best practices. And there's not enough of that. And I'm not a physician. I like to say I play one at meetings. But um, the, there are a lot of practices, particularly with private equity coming in and larger and larger practices, where there are huge differences within a physician practice. I had an example. Uh, one allergist in a practice had 60% of their patients on EpiPens. All the other physicians were between 15 and 25%. Something was wrong. And until that physician um, was accused of some major um, wrongdoing, nobody wanted to talk about that, that that physician was different. And I'm sure there are examples in all different areas, but AI can do that in a somewhat objective way. It doesn't mean all of a sudden, you know, make career decisions and personnel decisions based on just the computer, but that really smart person next to you um, to give the insights. And lastly, I mentioned this briefly, it's better understanding the natural history of disease. We have never had a tool like AI, generative AI, to be able to look at millions of records and millions of data points. The Framingham Heart Study did a great job, and so much of our insights today came from that and the Nurses Health Study, at least in the US. Um, how can we use AI to do that more systematically, more broadly? get the patient permissions we use, we need, and then use AI, quote, in the back office for the next five years to move it to the front office beyond that. Mara, you mentioned something really interesting, um, which I guess I hadn't really thought of, of the application of AI, which is more internally facing rather than patient facing. We've been talking about it mostly in the context of incorporating patient information to then ultimately help guide care. but. Uh, as you highlighted, there are a lot of, there's a lot of variability in practice patterns. And, and uh, in the infectious disease space, one of the places that we look at that is in antibiotic prescribing among primary care providers or ER providers. And right now, that's done almost you know, by hand. The information is manually collected and, and then analyzed and then ultimately feeds back to the providers to say, hey, you know, your peers are prescribing antibiotics 10% of the time. You're prescribing them 60% of the time. Let's, let's analyze that, right? So it's, it's not necessarily wrongdoing, but that feedback uh, is actionable and can really impact um, the way that that provider interacts with a lot of their patients and, and, and a lot of context in which that could work. Exactly, and link it to results. Right. So um, it may be that the 60% one is the better standard of care, but let's understand those differences. Yeah. And if I may, I would add to that that AI can also help with the large volumes of data, evaluating the biases that we have in the data itself, right? And I think that's one of the things we don't always think about, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So we need to identify what actually is useful data in those huge seas and volumes that we have and utilize that appropriately. And it speaks to what Gary was speaking about and the patient panelists were speaking about earlier that we really need to identify where the need is and use and collect the data that's useful for everybody in the population. So in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to again sort of go through the, the panel this time, perhaps we'll start with, with, uh, with Mara. What one thing would you identify um, to help reduce the information burden for physicians while still equipping them with the innovative tools that they need to improve patient care? It's such a tough question, but you know, it, this one is easy to say. It's the so what question. And the only way to do that, I think, is to do aggressive piloting. 
get it out there, try it in individual practices and in individual diseases so AI becomes better at getting to that number one or number two um, insight and question for that patient and then get doctors comfortable with using it. Yes, and I would definitely say from a uh, practicing physician point of view, you know, sometimes it's easy to recognize models that we've learned in medical school. We learned some statistical reasoning. It's easy to see in logistic regressions, you know, oh, these are the predictors, these are the outcomes. But AI and machine learning and other tools like that can seem like a black box, and it can seem very hard to understand exactly what's going on behind there, and therefore to trust it. And so. A lot of work needs to be done to make sure, number one, that AI is giving us the right outcomes, uh, but then also to help us understand what those outcomes mean, and so to put it in um, a format that's easily utilizable at the bedside. Well, I, I agree with that, and I think that variation is the enemy. You know, variation in practice, uh, variation in outcomes, variation in access, uh, you know, there, there's major problems in, in medicine with variation uh, between physicians, between centers, and even in, uh, amongst uh, physicians themselves. They'll, they'll vary in their practice from patient to patient. So developing systems and tools that decrease variation and make the application of medicine and of treatment predictable is gonna give us better outcomes for patients. It makes payers a lot happier. You know, that's the big frustration from payers is they can't predict how, especially in advanced cancer, you know, they talk about it as the Wild West. They cannot predict how a provider is going to treat that patient. And you can't predict from provider to provider how they're gonna behave. So I think, you know, AI, generative AI systems that help reduce variation, I think education, and um, pathways programs that help to reduce variation, uh, it results in better outcomes, and, and I think all of the stakeholders are happier. Uh, maybe I'll build on the comments of the other panelists. Um, most of the time, we use a stick rather than a carrot to motivate physician behavior, and to come back to the points made earlier, I think we need to think creatively about how to incentivize physicians and providers to do this. That can be something as, uh, mundane is a, you know, a, a bonus um, because that motivates behavior I've seen. Um, but there may be other ways. So we need to think about more of the carrot and less of the stick in implementing and encouraging adoption of new approaches and behaviors. Can I just add one thing to that? Because I think that's a great insight. Um, so insight to impact to implementation um, is that when you look at um, Airlines saying you're going to get your ticket on, you know, on your phone instead of on paper. They gave you an incentive to do it. All of these systems, it's a, such a great point, gave us incentives, which now we say, or it's, that's the standard. What would you do it any other way? Started with a bonus for doing it right. So I think that's a great point that we should um, definitely take to heart. Well, thank you all very much. I'd like to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Um, I think you've all touched on this a little bit, but while you're all mentioning that um, AI should be a partner to the physician, how do you ensure that as AI um, moves into the uh, more mainstream use, that the busy physician doesn't just start defaulting to accepting recommendations made by the AI system? So what sort of checks and balances do you envision could be implemented to still say that it is the physician's responsibility to own the final decision for how to treat that patient? Well, you know, I think um, that's where uh, the application of these uh, algorithms is so important. It, it, we have to stop at the level, I think, of uh, providing uh, data insights. You know, the, if these algorithms, if these systems can simply surface novel associations from thousands of data points and, and present to the treating provider, hey, here is something that is statistically anomalous, you know, but don't make any uh, additional subjective statements about maybe you should do X, Y, or Z. Can I just add one thing to that? Because I completely agree, but I also think that we need to 
uh, again, institutionalize, not just the classic omics, the, the tests and the diagnostics that Danaher and others do. We need to put in nutrition omics, psycho omics, um, behavioral omics, um, social determinants of health in that. I still think it doesn't change the fact that it still is the doctor's responsibility, but we have to broaden the set of information that go into that record. And just very briefly, I'll add to that exactly what Mara had said before about education. I think we need to educate physicians early on in medical school, as you said, how do we actually use these tools? Uh, yeah. uh, well, uh, thank you very much. We're out of time, but uh, fortunately there's a break that should be coming up, so if there are additional questions or, or uh, uh, requests of the panelists, uh, that'll be a good opportunity to do so. So please join me in thanking the panelists for their time.